Good evening, all. My name is Gary Chin, and I am Assistant Dean for Digital Learning and Interim Head of the Department of Graphic Design here at Penn State. On behalf of the College of Arts and Architecture, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Stuckman School Lecture Series and this evening's talk. Thank you for taking your time to join us this evening. To open up our lecture, I'd like to introduce Huan Lim, Assistant Professor in the Department of Graphic Design, who will serve as our host and moderator for the session. Okay, thank you, Gary. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege for me to introduce QR Sim and moderate his lecture tonight at Penn State University. The so QR Sim is a designer, researcher, and educator, and he is a professor of convergence design at Korea National University of Arts and a fellow of Royal Society of Arts. He was previously an associate professor of design at Carnegie Mellon University, where he was the director of the computational creative lab. He has served as National Steering Committee member for the Design Educators Committee of the American Institute of Graphic Art and Education Director of AIGA Pittsburgh. He has been awarded residencies and fellowships at Jan van Yak Academy in Netherlands, Frank's Russell Centrum in Belgium, Meta Open Arts, formerly Facebook Analog Research Lab. He also previously worked at Lust in Netherlands, MIT Sensible City Laboratory in USA, and the final in Korea. His work has been exhibited internationally at places including the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in USA, Museo Nacional da República in Brazil, and National Museum of Modern, Art, Modern and Contemporary Art in South Korea, and GGG Gallery in Tokyo, Japan, and in design festivals including AZI Open, Beijing Design Week, London Design Festival, Type Janji Biennial, and the Seoul Design Olympic. He holds a BFA from Hong Kong University in South Korea and an MFA degree from the Rhode Island School of Design in U.S. and conducted doctoral research at the Royal College of Art in U.K. So please give a warm welcome to Kua and the floor is yours, Kua. Hi, everyone. My name is Kua Shim and I go by Q, and thank you so much for having me here today. I'm very excited to be here, and today I'm going to show and talk about uh, computational design practices. And one sec, I'm gonna screen share. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Um, oh, one second. During the presentation, I'm gonna temporarily uh, turn off uh, my video. And I'll share it again. So I will start with my past project, Graphic Magazine's 37th issue titled Introduction to Computation. So in this project, my aim was to explore computational practices developed by graphic designers. The research on computation has been largely absent in the context of graphic design practices so most of the articles and dissertations that I searched for related to computational design were either related to engineering or architecture. And through the interviews and surveys, I explored the general attitudes and understandings of computation and graphic design. In particular, whether computation can be a graphic design medium beyond the means of production and the reasons people are using it in their practice. And there was one common question that I asked to all the contributors. And some of them were kind of like reluctant to agree with the idea. And they were saying like, I'm not a future religious or instead of the future, I would accept a future. However, uh, the majority of the contributors gave me like positive responses. 
such as we are already living in the future or how could it not be if the work can be abstracted into an algorithm it will happen like programming is no longer future some contributors stated that we are experiencing the merge of two disciplines design and engineering You'll probably be curious why I initiated the project. So one day after the talk and workshop that I gave, I received a question, do you see yourself as a designer or a programmer? And I said, of course, I'm a designer. And I see myself as a designer who utilizes code as a primary medium for creative practice. But in my mind, I was very nervous and shocked because I realized that audiences were kind of focused on the means rather than um, the main context the code was used for. To give you more context, I'll briefly go through what inspired me when I first started working on this and the relevant resources that can be useful for um, all of you. One of the biggest inspirations to me was the work done by uh, the designers and researchers at MIT Media Lab's Aesthetics Computation Group. Uh, John Maida was the director of the lab before he joined RISD as president, and he demonstrated how code can be a medium, both process and material in creative practice by generating visuals through algorithms. The title of the book on the left is Designed by Numbers, and you can see that DBN is highlighted there. Uh, that's also the name of the programming environment that he built, and he used it to create examples that are included in the book. And uh, more importantly, um, his former students, Ben Fry and Casey Reese, were inspired by it and made um, processing, which we use today. It is impossible not to acknowledge Muriel Cooper, like who was the book designer of MIT Press and then became the director of Visible Language Workshop. Since uh, mid 1970s, uh, for two decades, Cooper's work was centered in designing interfaces for designers, like using programming languages to create tools for others. Compared to Cooper's time, for Maeda and his students, there were already well-made software tools like Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator, Macromedia's director, and Flash. So their focuses were much more on giving forms in new ways through code and creating interactions with, um, I mean, between input parameters from various devices and visual parameters of the form. Maida designed a series of graphics for Morisawa company, like Fawn Foundry in Japan, using their logo. Uh, without knowing programming, we can count the number of repetition per row and kind of get a sense of repetition and automation from the work. To me, it looks like infinite, like who would want to ex execute it by hands? Like I would never do that. And how might a human perform the job this precisely? Also, Maida described that he used PostScript for generating these in at the time, um, he said it took a while, but I bet it would have taken much longer if he did it manually. If you're interested in reading online articles on contemporary computational design in visual communication context, I suggest you reading uh, my new series called CDP, which is an acronym of computational design practices on AIJDC websites. 
Another reference I would recommend is Code as Creative Medium, a book co-authored by Golan Levin and Tiga Brain. Okay, uh, then uh, what is computational design? Considering how things are created, distributed, and interacted through computational media, computational design is becoming increasingly important. But when you Google this, there's still a lot of material related to architecture or engineering. Well, first, how do designers use a computer in their practices? Today, uh, working with various attributes to give form is very familiar to all of us. One day I op opened like InDesign and aligned multiple tool windows based on their functions. However, computational design is more than simply using one of the software tools in Adobe Creative Cloud. Designers use a computer to create not only artifacts, but also systems. And systems are not just in designers' minds anymore. They're crafted with code and generate outputs in real time. Going back to the screen capture of Adobe InDesign, by combining these attributes and functions, we make complex decisions in our making process. But what if a computer actually automates the process? Uh, in this example, in my past work, uh, this is my past work and the cover of Graphic Magazine's 37th issue. And um, it was, I mean, the magazine was vinyl wrapped. So I wanted to allow people to roughly see what's in it. And using an algorithm, I created about like six ish um, important keywords for the issue and automatically go through InDesign file page by page and check if there were any matches with the keywords. And this is close up view and you can see uh, the page, both page numbers and um, the names of interviewees and some of the keywords. Uh, going back to Maeda, he defined computational designer as someone who, who designs products through code and the products are used by billions of people. So basically, digital designers who build mobile and web applications. He argued the importance of code and data, which I agree, but I would like to focus on what does it do for graphic design and designers? This is how I would define computational design. And there are largely three conditions. First, designers use code to build software. Second, uh, they do this to express their ideas and they do so algorithmically and parametrically. Third, the computer generates a variety of outcomes, so not just a single outcome. Let's take a look at uh, some examples. So it was made more than a 10, 10 years ago, and I created a tool using Voronoi and Delaunay triangulation algorithms that enable users to change the values of parameters within uh, the certain ranges that I define. Within the process, uh, the algorithms determined uh, certain styles, visual patterns, and uh, these were the outcomes. And I recommended this book earlier, and it's a project that I had contributed um, in 2020. And we designed a book with code. 
and it is the first computationally designed book to be published by the MIT Press. Then what do I mean by design computationally here? Is the entire book produced automatically? I would say that every page is generated through code, but I left some tasks that require like human eyeballing. In that sense, uh, roughly almost like 95-ish, uh, I mean, percent of it was produced by a machine. One really interesting thing about this process was defining all the character styles in paragraph styles in InDesign, then using code to load and apply them. It, it is very similar to the way we combine CSS, HTML, and JavaScript for designing a website and for digital editorial design. I mentioned that automation is the most obvious advantage of using computational process in design. It indicates a few things about the design process. First, it means that the computer can calculate things tremendously fast. Second, it means that it never makes mistakes. If there's an error, it's on the designers and their logic. Third, uh, the labor for implementing design decisions has become close to zero, almost nothing. So designers can have more time on shaping their logic, concepts, and crafting systems. Many designers and researchers recognize that there is a transition in designer roles from making forms to devising formations. What I mean by that is as designers use code to build their own tools, the relationships between the tools and us designers have become more personal. So the decisions that we make in the process of building tools directly inform our thinking and subsequent decisions. The process is highly iterative and reflective. When I talk about my practice, I say that I build systems rather than tools and that I focus on designing the process of emerging forms or what I'd call formation. Beyond automation, computation yields the opportunity to work with variable forms and variations in my practice. In this work, forms are directed um, and dictated by seeded random numbers, which are triggered every few seconds. It was not about designing a single composition. Rather, it was about designing how variations of compositions emerge. Therefore, I systematically designed the variable patterns, but the details in each variation were unexpected. Together with unexpectedness, it was my aim to achieve cohesiveness across the variations so that they are always slightly different from one another, but they maintain unity because they share the same constraints within which there was a range of freedom. In this case, uh, the outline of letters was constant while randomly cropped image in each particle, rotation, scale, number of repetition were variables. In this case, the outline of letters was constant. And you can see um, the variations of individual parts. 
all these permutations were made out of like repeatedly drawing a square on top of other squares. Randomness can be used as a way to implement a bit of playfulness when generating unpredictable variations. It's like working with freedom in a somewhat controlled manner rather than pure chaos. An interesting point is that I instructed my computer to randomly choose colors and draw a line from randomly distributed points every few seconds, which means um, I knew roughly uh, what kind of patterns I would see in the next few seconds, but I could not foresee the color, shape, and direction of line after a second. I mean, the details. The most compelling aspect of utilizing computation in my practice is the considerations of transformation and variations. I design systems that generate variations within uh, certain visual patterns. In this example, I made a system that gradually enlarged the circles in each color channel and make them travel towards different directions. And at the time, uh, the contrast between the circles inside and outside of the text was maintained. We can see the departure and arrival of the transformation here. And although there is no effect like this in After Effects, but if you assume there is one, we can probably create a structure like this with two keyframes. <laughs> The variations can be animated for endless permutation of values and properties. In 64 variations, the program creates the perpetual flow and movement. So in addition to the shift in color and position of visual elements, there were variables that randomized speed and interval of the movements. Instead of shuffling within a few options, the variations can be seamless. Unlike the previous two projects, the system in this work creates continuously flexible form. So the generated letter forms have different details, but the same look. In this project, it was important to check that the outcome always gets more than 30 frames. So this is kind of like a test screen. Um, so I can see how many lines um, are generated uh, on each letter form and how fast they are. Because automation is premised when building computational systems, I can see rules considering the numerical representation and modularity of forms. In this work, I define rules that make modules to transform according to the color values of an image input and resolution of grids. As you can see, I create variations by manipulating parameters and the algorithms that I write dictate patterns. Using code, I design systems that produce complex, flexible, and myriad forms. In addition to making forms kinetic, computation yields the opportunity to drive data in those variable forms. For example, I designed a digital installation for graphics RCA 50 exhibition that loads images from an online database and autonomously updates new
like a play, uh, there was transition between three different scenes where particles are composed with different behavioral patterns. To demonstrate the process of continuity, I created an atmospheric and fluid landscape of moving image archives that are automatically updated from the open database and displayed in real time during the exhibition. In another project that was made for uh, Taipo Janchi, like um, International Typography Biennial in Seoul, I wrote a program that creates letter forms using a sequence of imagery data from Google's Street View API. The Street View is such a well-known service, so it was easy to communicate the idea that data can be injected to typography form. However, it was difficult to show the real time aspect in this work. So I added more instructions that distort the letter forms based on the wind data of each city received from the public weather API in real time. In this way, um, we can design formations that are reflective of real time context. It is important that designers interpret the context and create interesting relationships between data and form based on that. In this work, I was curious how computation may inform typography related to writing and speaking. I wanted to represent human factors in handwriting through a computational system when users write by typing on keyboard. So I track the speed and pressure by monitoring the time in gyro sensor, which is built in a MacBook. Uh, so when keys pressed and released, I measured um, the duration and used them as custom input parameters to vary the width and weight of letters. And uh, you're currently watching the documentation of the project. And in addition to generating form, uh, form can be stored as a um, combination of data. Spoken word is a generative system. that responds to speech. That responds to speech. <laughs> In addition to perform a, a custom typewriter, I made a simple sketch to computationally explore speaking and typography. It was a one day experiment like using speech recognition API and it repeats letters based on the detected volume of my speech. But as you can see, uh, the result was imperfect and uh, somewhat hilarious. And uh, when designing systems that involve AI, we should embrace unexpectedness. In addition to an interface made for a single user or participant, in this work, I explored how multiple people can experience co-presence and collaboratively doodle in virtual space. I stored some of the participants' inputs to create prints, which were uh, the rendition of collective inputs. 
And beyond using participants' inputs to create visual artifacts, with computation, we can collect, analyze data to create meaningful information. In this project, my RAs and I wanted to explore how Google Fonts are used, I mean, in which context. So when you go to Google Fonts websites, they store fonts based on typography classification, width, weight um, of fonts, and new, popular, and trending fonts. But um, for us, it was not enough. What if we need to create design work for the clients living abroad and we're not familiar with the culture and language there? In this project, we explored participants' typographic preferences based on adjectives, geographic locations, and languages. Basically, it was an A-B testing website asking the appropriate fonts to the keyword, but we got the locations from IP addresses and the languages from browser language settings. After entering responses, oh, sorry. After entering responses, people were able to view the results. So uh, we've looked at some of my inspirations, uh, the seed to my research on computation as a creative designer's medium and defined computational design, then saw a few examples of its implementation in uh, generative design. I guess that some of you might be still curious about related references to my work. So I wanna briefly talk about um, decision-making and design, designing systems um, inspired by Kyle Gerstner. So uh, Gerstner in his designing programs beautifully described programming from a conceptual standpoint and stressed the active making selections. For Cooper Hewitt's National Design Triennial Beauty, I used this idea to demonstrate that form can be conceived through the choice of parameters. Using computation, parameters become continuously variable, and designers conceive permutable options that can be selected by machine over time. In this way, I'm crafting the patterns of the instructions for my computer which generates form that I imagine. As a last remark, I would like to show this project which can show an interesting combination between analog and computational making. I drew 60-ish patterns with circles in Illustrator, then computationally measure the average brightness of each, then wrote code that renders each depending on the brightness of an input image for the restoration. And in this project, I wanted to explore how much I rely on automation and what's gonna happen without it, especially when giving form. These are the stamps that I used to um, create prints by hand. I came up with some instructions for myself to save my life and work efficiently. Uh, if you look at the image carefully, uh, you should be able to see uh, that they're all labeled. And this system showing the numerical representation of brightness of each cell was uh, the counterpart to the labeled stamps. And there were multiple options I could choose per each brightness level because there were multiple stems. So with this setup, there was interesting impromptu moments in every step, which is pretty awesome and also different from simply randomizing numbers, but using computation. However, the system and stems were not enough because um, 
I still made so many errors. So um, the way we typically read pixels using code is from top left to bottom right. But because I'm a human, not machine, it did not work for me. So I needed to create new rules for myself. So I highlighted the areas uh, with the same brightness levels. And each print took roughly an hour and a half to produce. To me, the most interesting thing in the process was um, my mistakes, which I would not get if I just used computation for the rendition of outcomes. So the precision and speed, uh, which affect labor, labor uh, were main things that I realized while producing these prints. And I also questioned, what if I produce this computationally? So instead of stamping, I rendered more complex version of it by adding more channels and increasing the rows and columns of the grid. But um, as you can guess, um, it took much less time. But as you can see, there is no error. For the National Design Triennial, I made a bigger version of it. Um, and it was if else. Uh, I wanted to share with you that computation is um, designer's medium, um, which you can use uh, to explore new ideas and do new experiments. And thank you all for listening to uh, my presentation today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about anything you just saw and also about anything you didn't see, but want me to address. Thank you, Yua. Yeah, it was a really impressive work. And yeah, thank you for sharing your all the impressive work with us tonight. And I just left some uh, chat on the chat window. So if you guys have any questions, then feel free to leave it to the chat. Then I can go over some of them and ask the question to the QA. And while I'm waiting the, some questions from the public, yeah, the, all the work you shared with us is really amazing. And this is uh, some of the, the interested area also for me as a graphic designer, because uh, so far, I'm just trying to use a kind of old school method to use the, the illustrators or some other things. But the computational design with the real time data is a kind of the good area, the good media for the graphic designers to explore more and to make a good experiment. And just based on the, the some work you shared with us today, I'm just curious that the, the you the one of the, your work for the type of Janchi finally in Seoul use the street view pictures and letters and make it some generated some art or some then I'm just curious that what kind of message you wanted to convey through your work yeah with a computational art with a street view and the letters That's a great question. Um, so I only showed a few renditions of uh, letter forms uh, made with um, the data, Google Street View data of like each city, but uh, there were also um, a bit of randomization. So uh, for Tokyo, for example, there were there could be like thousands or millions of variations um, um, made out of the uh, like street view uh, footages uh, taken from different locations because it's difficult to um, kind of like uh, represent 
a city using a photo of a single spot. So it was very flexible. So there could be um, like millions of uh, representations of New York mm-hmm. City and like London. So uh, I wanted to, um, I mean, I used computation to um, like represent each city um, through a range of um, like permutable options Mm -hmm. because um, depending on where you are in um, the city um, you would see the different view and you would Mm -hmm. get like different like uh, like billboards and you would you would um, yeah so I I just wanted to um, show that kind of uh, perspective um, in the work Got it, got it. So you mean that you want to represent some kind of diversity of the, each city, some kind of mm-hmm. differences through the, the images we can get the, the publicly, right? Through the, the right. Google Street View and use some letter forms as a, as a form, right? Uh, yeah, kind of like a visual abstraction of each city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. And I think, yeah, the no questions so far, right? And I also... The computational design as a, because one of the, my interest areas are data visualization. So it's a little, I do not use the computational design yet, but it's a sort of that I also learned the Python's and the using some process to make some generative art. But do you have any recommendations, some students who has no experience with really the coding at all? Then could you make some recommendation where they can start it? So in my class, I uh, introduced P5.js, which mm-hmm. is a JavaScript library for creative coding. And the syntax of P5 is very similar to processing. And it's uh, widely applicable because uh, students can apply um, what they learned um, while using P5 uh, when they make their own websites. Mm-hmm. And uh, P5 is um, very strong. Like, I mean, it, it's fast enough to um, do, uh, I mean, create complex artifacts. And if students want to, um, like, make something faster and more complicated and uh, uh, drive more data and sensors uh they may use like processing because mm-hmm. it has like more libraries and for exhibition purposes like uh, people can use um touch designer which is a visual programming so node based like and it's uh you can still write in python but it's uh you can simply create very um attractive and um complex uh, structure without a single code, a single line of code, yeah. Uh-huh, got it, got it. So it's a kind of more the user-friendly the program that designers can use. All right, good. All right, and maybe just uh, one last question, I think so tonight, because there's uh, no questions from the public. But I just got the, the one, the first questions you started today, uh, tonight lecture is going to be, the might programming or computational system be the future of the graphic design process? And did you, have you still looking for the answer for this question or some answers you found about that questions? What do you think about some future of the graphic designs in the field? Because uh, I, every student, mm-hmm. yeah, every student just, you know, the start thinking about, talk about the, the AI designs or something we may be you know, replaced by the, the AI like that. But what do you think about the, the future of the graphic design in terms of the computational design? I think it's going to definitely inform uh, the way graphic designers like think and make, I mean, think about things and make things uh, for sure. And But more importantly, it's going to affect uh, the way um, I mean, the relationships between designers and like clients and 
so for example, uh, Coda's creative medium, uh, the book that I designed uh, for uh, Golan and Tiga, uh, what's really interesting to me uh, in the project was um, the project proposed a new relationship between designers, editors, authors, and publishers, mm -hmm. because they, you know, like without uh, the agreement, the project, I mean, the book would not exist. So they all uh, accepted the idea of like using computation. And uh, so instead of uh, designers received, so me and my friend uh, received um, the content like imagery um, and um, like text from authors uh, after they're done. Like we received the content um, like very early. So um, we made um, a rough system uh, which allowed them to uh, see uh, what their book would look like. So like every week they were able to simulate and render a new like a um, rendition of uh, their content uh, in InDesign. But uh, like designers would not do that. Like, uh, I mean, without computation because it's gonna be very painful to update content like weekly basis. Yeah. And um, another um, interesting, aspect um in the project was um like like the way we build a website the part uh, where we put like a i mean store and put uh like content on database like for example for like cms website like uh, it's uh it's stored on database and uh, designers are mostly only manipulating um the front end part like using css and html mm -hmm. and that's um like how we worked on uh in that project so um which means um it's gonna and i already see um there are so many designers who design templates and selling templates and designing templates and uh like considering um a variety of like platforms out there and like software tools so in when i had a conversation with ellen um like in 2016 uh she uh already speculated that um the designers of future would um in the future would be um template designers i mean and could be and um yeah and lastly, in terms of like AI, I think it's gonna allow us to um, like extend, sorry, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I think AI will extend our capability of uh, like thinking about our concepts and producing visual forms, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think it's gonna ever directly uh, replace uh, designer roles. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I also agree that the, the AI, the sketches, we can use the, some templates. That this is really good. The tools to make some experiment really quickly with all the resources they can find through the website all the website but yeah i also read that this is a kind of good things to get some inspirations but yeah still it's a kind of the beginning area so it's a it's going to be maybe the long time take a long time to replace the actual the human activities the capacity yeah got it yeah thank you so much yeah so i think that yeah i think that's all we have and thank you again for your amazing lecture tonight and thank you for joining us at Penn State University, I know that this is the early morning in South Korea right now. So thank you all of your lecture tonight. And yeah, have a great day. And I hope I can touch be I, I can touch with you later to talk about more about the computational design and some other the research project. All right. Thank you.
That's good. Thank you again uh, for the invitation and thank you all for listening uh, to my talk. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.